through 16. We're going to be in two different places. Job 21, <coughs> verses 1 through 16. And I'm going to read this more, so it's going to be a lot to read. But it says, Then Job answered and said, Listen carefully to my speech, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me that I may speak, and after I have spoken, keep mocking. Mm. As for me, is my complaint against men? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be astonished. Put your hand over your mouth. Even when I remember, I am terrified, and trembling takes hold of my flesh. Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty in power. Their descendants are established with them in their sight, and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear. Neither is the rod of God upon them. Their bull breeds without failure. Their cow calves without miscarriage. They send forth their little ones like a flock, and their children dance. They sing to the tambourine and harp and rejoice to the sound of the flute. They spend their days in wealth. In a moment, go down to the grave. Yet, they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? Indeed, their prosperity is not in their hands. This is Job. We're going to flip over, and I look at this where we're going is God's answer to Job. This is just what I believe that we can use where we're going is an answer to Job. I'm not saying there's any scriptural context to support that. I'm saying this is what I believe. We can use it as an answer to what Job is saying in Job 21. Psalm 37 says, Do not fret because of evildoers, nor be envious of the workers of iniquity, for they shall soon be cut down like the grass and wither as the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on his faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your ways to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. He shall bring forth your righteousness as the light and your justice as the noonday. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way. Because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Hmm. Hmm. Skip down to verse 12. It says, The wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is come. Hmm. Job is voicing his frustration because of the things that he's being afflicted with. And he's looking at those that are unrighteous. And so he says, he voices <laughs> Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? Job, with his affliction, looks at the wicked, sees them prospering in their way. Mm -hmm. Yet, Job was a just and righteous man before the Lord, and he's being afflicted. So Job then says, in Job 21, Twenty-one and verse number four. 
He says, as for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Psalms 37, the word of the Lord in verse 13. Well, verse, let's say verse number five. It says, commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. Job 21, verse 4. As for me, is my complaint against man. And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Psalm 37, 5. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him. And he shall bring it to pass. It's going to register in just a moment. Job being afflicted. Job 21, verse 4, As for me, is my complaint against man? And if it were, why should I not be impatient? Psalm 37, 5 says, Commit your way to the Lord. Trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. <clears throat> okay. Psalm 37 and 7 says rest in the Lord. So we go back to Job, and I'm going to preach in a minute, but I'm just laying the foundation of what the thought is going to be for the day. We go back to Job, and Job says, let's skip down this time to verse 7. He says, why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty and powerful. Psalm 37, verse 7, says, Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Because of the man who brings wicked, it says, Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Got another section that we're going to skip down to, and then we're going to go ahead and pray. We're going to preach and get out the way. Then we're going to skip down to verse back in Job. Job 21. Thirteen, it says, They spend their days in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Yet they say to God, Depart from us. For we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty, that we should serve him. Psalms 37, verse 8 says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It only causes harm. Verse number Psalms 37. It says, The wicked plots against the just, verse 12, and gnashes at him with his teeth. The Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. So, we're going to do this real quickly, then we're going to pray. We're going to do Job 21, verse 4. As for me, is my complaint against man, and if it were, why should I not be impatient? Psalm 37 and 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Job 21, as for me, in verse 4, is my complaint against man, and if it were, why should I not be impatient? Psalm 37 and 7 says, rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Then if you go back up to verse number 5, where we started before, it says, Commit thy way to the Lord, trust also in him, and he shall bring it to pass. Then we go back to Job, and I know we're flipping, we're going to go, you're going to see the flow in a minute, but 
Then you go back to Job 21, verse 7. It says, Why do the wicked live and become old? Yes, become mighty and high. And then Job 7, continuing on, says, Do not fret because of him who prospers in his way, because mm. the man who brings wicked schemes to pass. Then Job 21 in verse 13 says, they spend their day in wealth, and in a moment go down to the grave. Verse 14 says, yet they say to God, depart from us, for we do not desire the knowledge of your ways. Who is the Almighty that we should serve him? And what profit do we have if we pray to him? Psalm 37, verse number 12 says, the wicked plots against the just and gnashes at him with his teeth. Verse 13, the Lord laughs at him, for he sees that his day is coming. If I was to use for a thought for today, it would be things are not always as they appear. And if I was to use for a sub thought, it would be looks can be deceiving. Things are not always as they appear. For looks can be deceiving. Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this show word. We thank you for an opportunity for us to come together and fellowship. Now, Father, we pray that you speak a word to your people. Father God, that would carry them on through another week, Father God. Give them hope. Give them life, Father God. Give them the faith to continue to believe, to move forward, Father God. We pray that you visit your people upon this day and give them a word that's going to speak life to them and speak revelation unto them, Father God, that they may continue to grow in you and may continue to serve you and may continue to walk upright before you, Father, with, uh, with loving arms wrapped around your spirit, wrapped around your presence, Father God. And as they try to wrap their arms around you, we pray that you wrap your loving arms around them and that you comfort them in these afflictions. Father, we pray and we give you the glory in Jesus' name. We just thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your kindness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for what you're doing in our lives, even now as we speak. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Job being afflicted. Job, the, the first chapter of Job, talks about Job being a, a just and upright man before the Lord. It talks about how Job was so righteous. To where when the enemy came looking for someone to devour, the enemy came looking for somebody to tempt, the enemy came looking for somebody to torment, for somebody to afflict. Job was so righteous and upright in his walk before the Almighty that the Lord recommended Job to his adversary. Mm -hmm. So Job is somebody who is an example of righteousness, an example of living a Job is a man who can be an example to us even today in our walk to the, you know, before the Almighty. Uh, there, what I'm talking about is verse 6, where it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered Job? Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Job was hand-selected for his affliction. Job was upright, he walked upright, walked, walked holy before the Lord, but when the Satan, his adversary, came looking for somebody, to afflict, looking for somebody to torment, looking for someone to possibly devour, the Lord said, have you considered Job? Now keep in mind that Satan had already been on the earth, had already been walking to and fro, going, you know, from here and there on the earth already, but Satan himself didn't identify Job when he was walking on the earth. That's a point of scrutiny because Satan, the adversary walking on the earth, was looking for who he can attack, who he can mm -hmm. devour, who he can afflict. But he overlooked Job. It was the Lord who hand-selected Job to be afflicted by the enemy. 
this is a point of scrutiny because oftentimes when we're going through different things in our life, first person we want to blame is the devil. First person we want to blame, even before we blame ourselves, even before we blame decisions that we made, whether they were good decisions, positive decisions, bad decisions, first person we want to blame is the devil. We didn't pay our rent so we can go to the concert. We get evicted, we blame the devil. We don't pay our rent so we can, you know, uh, get our hair done. We get evicted, who do we blame? We blame the devil. We don't pay our utility bill to get cut off. We didn't pay our utility bill because we wanted to go on the retreat that the rest of the family was going on. So we didn't pay, we didn't pay our utility bill. So when we got back from the retreat, our lights were shut off. We're sitting in the dark. We don't have no gas. Can't take a hot shower. But who do we blame? The devil. The devil was attacking me. I didn't pay my rent. I got evicted. The devil was attacking me. I didn't pay my utilities because I wanted to go on the family retreat. I come back. My utilities are shut off. I ain't got no hot water. Who do I blame? The devil. It's interesting that here we see where Satan was already on the earth going to and from on the earth trying to see who he can devour. But he didn't recognize Job. It was God when he came to present himself to God who said, have you considered Job? Now this is interesting because obviously there's some things that the enemy can't see in you that God knows about you. Okay, y'all too quiet. There's some things that your enemy, your adversary, even though they may be in your presence on a regular occasion, has no idea of the potential or the gifting or the anointing that God has locked up, wrapped up on the inside of you, right. even though they're in your presence on a regular basis. This is a point of scrutiny because while they're in your face, you know, treating you like the average Joe, or in some cases treating you like you are beneath them, or in some cases, I feel a shift coming here, and, and in some cases, you know, treating you as if you're not on a level or you're beneath them or that you're, or worse, that you are on their level and you're just simply on their level, but you're not who God called you to be. Right. They're in your presence, but they can't see what's down on the inside of you. Satan was going to and fro on the earth. It says he was going to and from on the earth looking to who he could see. That he was on the earth going to and fro. Job was on the earth. Satan didn't recognize or identify Job when he was walking on the earth. It wasn't until he came back into the heavenly dimension where he could actually sit down and have a conversation with the Lord, with God Almighty. And God said, have you considered? Isn't it interesting how a lot of times people will be right in your presence and have no idea of your potential? Yes. They have no idea what you're capable of. They, they ask you a question or they ponder a thought to you and then, you know, down inside of you because of your experience, because of your knowledge, because of your gifting or your anointing, you're able to give them insight to what they're asking you. And sometimes they look shocked because it's coming from you. But the reality is they can't see what's down on the inside of you. And so at times your enemy and sometimes even people who you consider to be your friends, even though they're in your presence, are shocked when God begins to move in you because they can't see your potential. And so what happens is God actually has selected Job for his affliction. And so a lot of people say, well, what did Job do? Did Job sin? Uh, did Job come up short? That, the relevant thing is that God has selected him. See, it's the carnal mind that tries to find out what he did. That's right. The spiritual right. mind acknowledges and recognizes that God chose me for this. And this is what God is saying to you this morning is, stop trying to blame your enemy or stop trying to rationalize why you're going through what you're going through. You have to understand that he chose you for this. Yes. So stop glorifying the devil for your affliction. Stop glorifying the devil for what you do or what you don't have. Stop glorifying the devil for your stumbling blocks and your struggles. You have to remember that God chose you for this. Now, if God chose you for this, he's only choosing you for it because he has the power to bring you out of it. Yes. The problem with the church is God chooses us for things, but then we get stuck in the affliction. We get stuck. We don't, we don't recognize and identify that God put me in it, then he's more than able to bring me out of it. Right. Because God's not going to put me in something to consume me. So if God has selected me for my affliction, then that means he's going to pull me out of my affliction. But on the other side of my affliction, there's going to be a greater glory. There's going to be a greater anointing. There's going to be a greater revelation of his presence. There's going to be a greater manifestation of his power. Now, the problem with us is when God puts us in an affliction, we begin to try to help God and get our way out of it.
to the point to where we start causing it to be worse than what it really had to be. Right. God wanted to put us in it for a season. But because of our choices and our decisions, we get stuck. The children of Israel, when God was bringing them out, it, it was a three-day journey turning into four, more than 40 years. Why? Because they got stuck in their affliction. They, got, they was in slavery for 400 years. Mm. A three-day journey, they could have been in the promised land in three days. But they got stuck. Never mind the fact they was enslaved for 400 years. That boy. They got stuck during a three-day journey. How many times is it that it looks like God's going to bring us out, but then all of a sudden it looks like it gets prolonged? Right. How many times does it look like or God has said that he's pulling us out, and it begins to look that way, but on our way to where we're thinking we're on our way to deliverance, it seems like it gets prolonged. And then we end up blaming God because we don't believe that God kept his word because he said he was bringing us out. But what we fail to acknowledge is that on the journey, we changed our perception. We was praising God when he was saying he was going to bring us out. We was praising God when he was saying he was going to deliver us with a mighty hand. But on the way out, we get comfortable because now we know we're on our way out. Right. So now we're comfortable. We fall back into our old ways because now we're comfortable. Mm -hmm. When we were not comfortable, we was praying to God. We was asking. I was crying out, Lord, help me. Lord, deliver me. Lord, save me. But when he begins to bring us out, we get comfortable. And once we get comfortable, we get lax. And when we get lax, we get stagnant. Once we get stagnant, we begin to fall back into our old ways. And we begin to fall back into very ways that had us in prison for over 400 years. Mm -hmm. So what turns from a three-day journey becomes prolonged because they fell back into that same mindset to where they began to murmur, began to complain, began to doubt, began to even say things, go as far as to say we was better off when we was in Egypt. And so when you have that mindset, because there's some enemies you're going to have to face, and there's going to be some demons and some devils that you're going to have to fight, there's going to be some adversaries that you're going to have to confront, there's going to be some issues in your own life that you're going to have to look in the mirror and take authority over, that when you begin to do that, it begins to say, well, I was better off Yes. before I had to go through this. I was better off in unproductive relationships because waiting on a husband is too long. Mm. I was better off when I was out making my own money because waiting on the Lord to provide is too difficult. I was better off when I was by myself and I was in bitter and didn't want to let nobody get close to me because showing compassion hurts. And so what happens is we begin to fall back in our old ways. We begin to fall back into our old coping mechanisms. And so what happens ultimately is because we begin to fall back in our old ways, we begin to rebirth that old culture and that old environment that God was actually bringing us out of. Because we fall back into the same mindset. So just because he's changing the environment, if we have the same mindset, we can actually reproduce our old environment in a new setting. Yes. Somebody missed that. What actually happens is, even though you may move, you can come from Ohio, you can come from California, you can come from New York, you can move from Florida to Hawaii, you can move from Hawaii to Rio de Janeiro, you can move from there to Tahiti. As long as you keep the same mindset, that part. You can reinvent your environment from wherever you're fleeing, wherever you land, because the problem is not the setting where you left. The problem is your mindset. And so what happens is we bring our mindset into a new environment, same mindset into a new environment, expecting different results. And then when we don't get the new results that we're expecting, now we want to blame God. Right. Because we feel like God is not honoring his part even though we brought the same mind that we had from an old setting to a new setting and reproduce that same environment in a new setting. And so what Job is saying in verse in chapter 21, he's actually voicing his frustration because he was perfect and upright. And perfect just basically means thoroughly furnished unto good works. It's like don't don't let it bother you. Don't let it get too deep and profound according to what Webster says. Perfect concerning the spirit is just thoroughly furnished in good works. If you get confronted with making a right choice or a wrong choice, you make the right choice whenever the right choice presents itself. That's pretty much what perfect is. But the Bible says Job is just and upright before the Lord. 
So ultimately, in Job 21, you got to keep in mind, Job then lost his kids, his house that burned down, his wife that left him because he wouldn't forsake God. And so Job was in a situation now to where he was lost pretty much everything that he had, everything that was significant and important to him, but yet he's looking at the wicked prosper. He's looking at the wicked uh, becoming a mighty, you know, he says mighty and power or living older and things of that nature are becoming, being able to walk in wealth and prosperity and to the point to where they're even saying, we don't even want to know about God. Hmm. They so comfortable in their wealth, they don't even want to know about God. They don't want to know his ways. They don't want to know who he is. They feel like they don't need him. And isn't that a significant that in this day and time, people in Hollywood that have money or your athletes that have money, they don't want to know have nothing to do with God. Why? Because they feel like what they have is what's significant to them. Right. That God can't give them wealth. That God can't give them the rich life. That God can't allow them to brush shoulders with the upper echelon of society. And so what happens is because the church is so worldly, and here we go, the church is so worldly mm -hmm. to where the church wants to be like the world. So they see the world prosper. They see the world driving nice cars. They see the world with all the bling bling. So now the church wants what the world has. That's right. The church at one point used to be content with just the presence of God, to where the presence of God was just enough. But now the world is, is appealing to the church. So Job is an example to where he's voicing that frustration that many of us feel in the church to where we see the wicked prospering, but it seems like all hell is breaking loose in our life. And Job is like, what's going on? What's the deal? You got to tell me something. I was serving you. I was loving you. You have to tell me something. How come they're prospering and I'm going through hell? Mm -hmm. Job is a man who is voicing the frustration that many church folk today voice. Except Job, the difference between us and Job is that Job, he voices his, frustra his frustration. But he still acknowledges that God was who he was. Many of us today, we run from God. When things don't go the way you want. Mm. The church is so tainted and so polluted in this day and time. And I know a lot of people may not get with this. But the church is so polluted and tainted in this day and time that the church would much rather have prosperity and riches than have God's presence. That part. <laughs> okay, let me dig a little deeper because I know I already know I'm going to get in trouble with this message today. The, 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 the church looks at the world. And they see all the popularity, the fame. They see all the notoriety and all the recognition that the world has. And they see all the wealth that the world has. They hear all the stories of all the Hollywood celebrities. They see all the reality shows where they're flourishing. And so the church looks at the world, and instead of them being content with the presence of God, they want the prosperity of the world. And so what happens is their, their focus has shifted to where now they're no longer bowing down or acknowledging Jehovah Elohim Yahweh, now they're bowing down to man. So now they're selling out who God really is, being the most high almighty Elohim, to follow and chase after man and for materialism, prosperity, and wealth. And it starts with the preachers in the pulpit trying to preach you that, that you could be rich and you could be wealthy. And yes, that's true because God has given us the power to get 